and we're back here. What are we on? Uh, episode four or five of uh, the Damage Done podcast here. We're doing a third That's volume it. of our murder and redemption, crime and redemption uh, series. Today we're going to have uh, quite an interesting story for you. Uh, incredible human being that uh, lived quite an interesting life, put him in a position where he was wrongfully accused of murder, sentenced to 33 years in prison, spent 25 of it, and from what I gather, he still felt, though he was wrongfully accused, that he deserved to be there, but mm -hmm. somehow, some way, he found it, found a way, I guess I'd call it, to uh, change his life, change his way of thinking, seeing the world, and now he's out in the world changing lives and uh so i want to work on our guest caesar mm. thank you bro thank welcome you, man. bro thank, thank you for you. coming out thank you Absolutely. so you know let's let's just rock with it man um how how does one get themselves in a position where they can get sentenced to 33 years in prison and then come out on the other side of it such as you have we'll work towards i guess you know how you got to that position to you know change your life and then change other people's lives and have the impact that you have but uh, you know where did where did it start i'm sure you didn't just accidentally get sentenced to 33 years in mm -hmm. prison there was a build-up to that so let's start there well in uh, 1991 uh the gang that i was part of we were at a war with another gang right we're at war with them and where's and, this taking place uh, in watts okay got right? it right so it was a war where uh it was back and forth. You know, it wasn't like, oh yeah, not today. Like, no, it was back and forth. It was pretty, pretty crazy, pretty crazy times, right? And um, so on the retaliation from, uh, they had murdered one of my friends, right? A few months passed and one of their guys got murdered, right? That time I lived in the heart of my neighborhood. Like my house was like one of the main houses that was there. And Watts was a bit more wild then, obviously, than it is today. People, you know, know Watts from whether it's the Watts riots during the, the L.A. riots. Yeah. And even now people know Watts. as a, it's, it's not a nice suburban neighborhood, so it can be yeah. rather violent, correct? Yeah. And then it's crazy because it's, it's, it's Watts gangs within each other that are fighting each other. Usually Watts gangs are together, but at that time everybody was on their own. Okay. And uh, anyway, so uh, the murder happens. I get arrested. I'm 17. It was me and my co-defendant. And, uh, you know, I start off in juvenile hall. And, you know, I'm like, well, I didn't do this. So I was okay. Like, this is jail. Eventually, the truth's going to come out, and I'm going to go home. Mm -hmm. Right? And I also chalked this up as a little war story. I came to you know, jail. I got tried for murder. And I get tried as an adult, and I get sent to the county jail. Okay. Right? And I remember I was in uh, juvenile hall, and the bus came and picked me up. And I ne I've seen buses before, but when I seen the L.A. County bus, it just looked You're talking humongous. about the L.A. County Sheriff's bus? Yes. Yeah, been there. It just looked Not humongous, fun. right? And I'm like a kid, and I'm looking at it like, wow, like, whoa, like, this, this just got real right now, right? Because I'm in juvenile hall, and I'm a bunch of kids, and, uh, you know, my age, now I'm going with the, the big dogs. Sure. And I get over there. And I remember, because when we first got arrested, it was four of us, right? Uh, and then it was just became two of us. Hmm. Um, the other two were let go for whatever reason. They didn't say nothing against us or nothing. They just got let go. They said, okay, we need a driver and a shooter. And we got them here. Got it. So you they guys, let, you, they, they, they so picked, it was like an un un two. unlucky, uh, you know. Yeah. Draw of the straw. Draw of the straw. I, don't believe, yeah. I don't believe that they knew exactly who they who they needed to charge. And I remember one of my one of my homeboys that was in the tank with me, uh, he was like, Man, what are they like what are we here for? Like what are they what are they getting us for? Oh, for this murder. And they're like, wait a minute, when did this murder happen? And he's like, Oh, it happened on, on um, uh, March third. And they're like, you know, it was the same day of the Rodney King beating. Really? Right? Yeah, it was the same the same day. Oh, That's why it was it was crazy because I was watching that Rodney King. So every, you you know news. exactly where you were at and what you were yeah, doing. Yeah, I was home. Such a monumental. Yeah. So you yeah. were home during the murder. So you're Ex definitely innocent. Exactly. So, um, so my home was like, yeah, it was the night of the, the you know, and he was like, man, I was in the county jail. So he tells the sheriff in the station, like, hey, what are, you, what are you charging me with? Oh, we have you for the murder. For what murder? Oh, I'm murdered on such and such date. 
And he says, well, I was in the county. I was in the county lid at that time, so how can it be me? Mm-hmm. They went and looked. And then they said, okay, no, you're here for receiving stolen property. Because he had a big old, you know, where I was from, the gang that I was from, he had a big old street sign in his house when they raided his house. So they cut him loose. They just said, just you know like what? that. Yeah. And then wow. my other my other homeboy co-defendant, he didn't even make it to the courtroom. He got cut loose right before he went to court. Remember, they just like DA so, reject status or something. Yeah, they just looked at him yeah, and like throw like it out. Yeah, like a DA reject, and they just cut him loose. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, me and my co-defendant begin, you know, fighting these 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 charges. And it's funny because as I was driving over here, I passed by the Hall of Justice. Right here, and that's yeah. where I was at for two years fighting this case. Wow. Right? So I was telling my, my girl about it. I go, man, this is my mom used to be standing out here for hours so she can come and see me for 20 minutes. Right? Jeez. And then the next day, all over again. So anyways, to make a long story short, I litigated my case for about 15 months, and I lost. Right? Okay. So when I lost... Were they offering you deals? I mean, obviously, you litigated your case when you went to trial, but did you, did you, were you offered deals that you're like, no way, I'm going to win this, I'm not taking it? Or like, did you no. just went straight to the box, took it? They never offered me a deal. I believe they thought they had an open and shut case with no evidence. Um, all they had was just one guy saying that he see me driving the car. That's all they had. They didn't have no gun. They didn't have no... So the crime was committed March 2nd, March 3rd. I got arrested in May. Mm-hmm. Right, my code is finished. They raided our houses, they take us in, and um, so they didn't have anything. Mm-hmm. So they, they didn't had have a, a murder they, weapon? They had, a, they had no murder weapon, they had no fingerprints, they had a picture of the vehicle that was supposed to have been used and that was parked in front of my house. So my argument was always on a murder scene if there was a vehicle parked right there that was used to commit a crime, wouldn't the smart thing would be in the car? fingerprint look for shell something why would you just leave the car there and just take a picture but That's back funny. in 1991 all they needed was somebody to say it was shame i seen it. them they just and that's witness. all they needed wow. and you were convicted Jesus. right so that's what happened with me and you know when i was litigating my case man um you know i i, I was a i was a i was a spiritual person in my own way and okay. i will pray every night you know uh, if God really sees everything, then of course He's going to see that it wasn't really me, mm-hmm. and the truth's going to come out. But Sorry. I want to—I want to ask you a question. You said you were spiritual in your own way, which I love. Were you spiritual in your own way when you were running around in the streets too? I mean, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What, I, is that, what does that I look just, like? Uh, I would justify my behavior, even though I was a certain person, yeah. right? And I would do certain things. Uh, I still had a higher power, you know, according to me. This, or, you know, yeah. of, course, of course, you're a gang member, so whatever was best for you is what's fitted for you, right? Sure. So I had a spiritual foundation in my own way, yeah. right? I, I believe, oh, I'm, you know, even though I believe in God, I'll still kill you, right? Got if it. you remind me, I'm still going to kill you. So that was my spiritual Your foundation. Your own brand of spirituality. So yeah. while I was litigating <laughs> this case in the courts and throughout the county jail, um, every night I would pray to God, like, come on, you, you see everything, like, you know, it wasn't me, yeah. you know? So, so when I got found guilty, man, I felt like God turned his back on me. I felt like there is no God. I felt like, you know what? There is no God. Sure. F God, right? Because there is no God. Because if there was a God, he's not going to let a 17-year-old kid go to prison for life. For life. No, no. And that's what they, that's what they handed down to you. My family life. would tell me, you know, you should go to church, pick up the... I was like, no. Why? Just to the, if there is a God, you allow that to happen to me, let's, F that. And I didn't even do it. So 15 years of my incarceration, because I went through, uh, I, I mean, I started from scratch. Juvenile Hall, County Jail, Y, two and a half years in Y, and then I went to prison. Oh, so after you got sentenced, you didn't go straight to prison? You went to YA first? Yes, I went to YA first. I was, old, I was offered um, what was called, a, it was a night of the observation, the youth authority. Yeah. And I went there for two and a half years, which mm. was cool, because uh, everyone that was there was under 25. So it was, you know, it wasn't as bad. But I remember I was up north. My first year that I was there, um, I was constantly getting in trouble. I was in fights. I was just, I was a mess. Yeah, I heard, and, you know, YA is pretty lawless. I mean, it's like, yeah. it's like gladiator well, especially, school. Yeah, especially up north. At that, that time, that youth authority was open. It's called CHAT. Okay. And it was freshly open. So when it's freshly open, everybody's fighting, right? Especially with people from up north. So... I was up there. I was messing up for my first year. My counselor tells me, look, man, 
uh, if you don't get it together, you know, we're going to ship you to Tracy because you're an M number, which means you're only supposed to be housed here until you're 25, and then, boom, you're out to the pen, right? And people that aren't M number just get out yeah, once they hit 25. Yeah, if they're not an M number, that means that they're, they're called the YA number, which is they get out when they're 23 or 25. Got it. Right, regardless of the, regardless of the sentence that they have. Got it. So I said, okay. So I, um, you know, I programmed for the second year that I was there. And like I was telling you, I, I was doing a great program and I loved it. And I had all this for uh, For, the, for the listeners out there, what, can you define what program is? I'm sure we'll use that lingo going through with just some well, people. Well, when you program is you stay out of trouble. Yeah. You, you, you get involved in like a lot of activities, a lot of sports activities. Whatever's offered to you, okay. you embrace it and you run with it. Got it. Um, at, at the same time, you get a lot more freedom. Right, you're not in your cell as much, so I had that, and I had it really good. I had a few jobs where it just kept me out. You know, I was a laundry worker, and I was an auto shop, so yeah. it just kept me out all day. I didn't feel like I was in jail, so I had it so good. Where when the time came up for them to transfer me down south, I was like thinking about it, and I was like, man, should I even go? Because I have yeah. it good here, should I even go? So when I spoke to my mom, my mom said, you know what, you should, because I don't want to be seeing you all the way up there five hours or six hours Fuck. all the way up north. I'm, you know, I'm going to see you right here. So I came down here, and when I landed in YTS, it was just, YTS was just, I don't know, man. I, I can't even describe it when I got there. Uh, everybody was on something. Wild and out? Yeah, everybody was on something. Did you do, were you a drug addict, though? No. No, you no, were never no. just. You were just. No, it w- that was never my thing. My thing was the lifestyle. I was addicted to this lifestyle. I was addicted to being a gang. So that's what I want to touch on. So I want to. I want to stop at that part of the story and go back because I think it would be interesting to, for people to know. Because I only know you as a, an amazingly good human. I'm sure you could probably agree that there was a point in time in your life where I'm trying to be as diplomatic as possible. Probably weren't <laughs> a good human. Yeah. How did you get in that position to be in the position you're screwed? Like, we you know we we're, we've been doing this you know, for a few episodes now, and one of the common themes that we've had in people that have been in similar situations to you is it, it's things that start at home. Like yes. their, their home thing and, and, and it's feelings of like fear or like disconnection, inadequacy, stuff like that. Were you experiencing similar things? Like how did you get involved in gangs, start committing crimes? What did that look like leading up to where you just left off? So I was born here, right, in L.A., born and raised in, in the city of Watts. And... When I was really young, like around six months old, I was sent to Mexico. Okay. Me and my sister were sent over there to live with my grandmother uh, because it was difficult for my parents to make ends meet while they had us here. Mm-hmm. So we would travel back and forth whenever it was convenient for them to have us here, you know, because they wanted to see us, obviously, but they would send us back. So around the age of two or three, I started figuring out what those long roads rides to the airport man with all our stuff packed up like you're going back and i didn't want to go back i wanted to be here i want to be like everybody else with their mom and dad right sure so but i I didn't have no say so so it it was what it was so when i finally when i finally when my sister and i finally came back when i was seven to live here for good Right, and I and take it. I, I don't speak the language. I've been living in Mexico my whole life. So you're so barely speak. speaking any English or no English at all. No English at all. Okay. At all, I have no English. I was like literally like, from Mexico. So I get enrolled into a predominantly all black school. I don't know the language, so I can't make any friends. I can't relate to anybody. Right. So all this stuff I started figuring out uh, as I began doing my transformation while I was in prison. Mm-hmm. Right, so this is how I came about putting my story together. Sure, uh, I was suffering from a lot of emotional stuff, uh, abandonment issues, right, uh, self esteem issues. So, um, it came to the point that throughout the hard work that I was doing in my transformation, that I, I believed and it wasn't true, I believed at 12 years old that nobody cared about me, right, that my parents didn't care about me because of the stuff that I was going through, they didn't care, right. Yeah. And it wasn't true. It it's was heavy. the stuff that I was making up in my mind because my parents did care about me, right? Because they had a business and they had, you know, I had a roof over my head. I had food on my stomach. I had clothes on my back, right? Uh, it's just that um, could they have done something differently? Of course. Sure. But all they wanted to do was provide. They did, right? the, they did the best they could with exactly. what they had, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I would never sit there and say, oh, it's their fault. No, it was just the stuff that I was going through emotionally that I didn't know how to deal with. Sure. I mean, at so, that time, you said it was their fault. Yeah. Now, I, I yeah. don't see so it now, was. Sure. So now, it's like, uh, 
now I go out into the streets, and what I'm missing at home, I find it in the streets, right? Got and it. I'm already angry yeah. because I feel like nobody gives a shit about me, right? So if you don't give a shit about me, well, I'm obviously not going to shit about you, right? So I become, you know, rebellious. I become violent. I become a gang member because yeah. you can't just be a gang member. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You have to have something. So you become, you know, that little kid that is running around doing stupid stuff. Right. And you you sort of make a name for yourself. So when that gang comes and tells you, hey, man, you know, you, you want to be part like of we this? We see you. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. see what you're doing. No, you want to be part of it? Touch on this right now because, you know, growing up how we grew up, it was, it was a bit nicer than growing up in Watts. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of I know there's a lot of kids that are younger from nicer areas listening to this right now. And they think that they're, you know, gang members or something yeah. like that. No. So I want you to touch back on it. It takes something to be a gang member, and, and that is. Yeah, it takes <laughs> it, it takes for you to to really like uh, uh, become aggressive, become violent, right? Because uh, you want to walk into something that with the reputation, like, oh, don't fuck with this fool. Yeah. This fool's a gunner, or this fool's a fighter, or this fool's this, or this fool's that. So everybody comes in with something. You just don't get asked out the middle of you know. Oh, like, hey, man, you want to be part of my gang because yeah. we need the numbers. So you want to be part of this gang? Like, no. You, you got to fit then, something. You got to fit the requirements. Yeah, you have to fit it, right? But also so, listening to like rap music and just like carrying a weapon, trying to act like you're tough, doesn't make yeah. you a gang member either. No, a lot of kids. No, you know, Shane and I talked about this. Like the things that we did. I mean, for for our area, it might have been quote unquote kind of gangster relative to how not gangster people <laughs> well, are. You well, know what I mean? But, it's funny because back in the mean streets of Plano, Texas, where I grew up, the gang. <laughs> That I, I was actually, we were a registered gang because yeah. we fought a lot and we sold drugs and parents called and they knew kind of like what we did. But I'm sure that there's a big difference between the gang activities well, that we were doing and, and what you guys were doing. So, right? so remember one thing, the definition of a gang, if yeah. you really look at it, the definition of a gang is two or more people up to devious behavior. That's the definition of a gang, right? So you don't have to have a nickname. You don't have to have a street. If it's... You know, two, three of you guys up to devious stuff that you just you just became a gang. Yeah, but Fair. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like I didn't have to worry about crossing the street and getting shot at, right? Yes. We're in, we're in a garage rolling blunts, listening to rap music, and yeah, yeah, like maybe beating up people a at parties. Of people, yeah, yeah. You know beating what up I mean? people it's at not... parties, listening to loud music with good with good sound system, stuff like that. Like I gotta be <laughs> home by 9 p.m. on weekday. You know, you know what I mean? Like that that that's the no, but it's like it's a major thing. There's there's yeah. there's like that's how I grew up, and that's how kids are growing up. I have younger siblings and like they, they, they think that they're they're doing something and you know it's important to I guess get this message out to the youth that it's not all glamorous like this is kind of be like the beginning middle and end like yeah. you're going to be explaining that lifestyle so, so I'm going to tell you I'm going to be honest with you yeah. straight up like when when I was uh, invited to be part of this gang yeah uh, man, I was I was I was looking forward to it. I didn't even think about it. I was like, man, I've been waiting for this moment. You felt like you landed my a whole big life. job, or well, I landed. Yeah. That's right? what I want to touch on too. Is yeah. you had that like aha, I had arrived moment yeah. at that age when they asked you to come. You felt like finally accepted, yeah, wanted, because and, we and all, seen. Right? We all want to. We all want to feel like we belong to something. Right, and that's and right? because you felt like you didn't belong so much. Like that's why it meant so much to you at that point in time. Is that exactly true? Exactly. Yeah. You know. So because again, I felt like I was a nobody. I Felt like I wasn't even looked at at home, yeah. but now I'm part of something. Now is some. Now I'm clean. So of course it was fun. Yeah. Of course the life. I loved. I loved everything that came with that lifestyle. Right. I fell in love with it, bro. Um, but then when I received that life sentence and I got sent up, up north, you know, or to the pen, um, I was like, man, this is real. Nice. This stuff just got real. Like it really did just get real. Like I'm probably gonna die here now. Probably 100%. gonna die in prison because of this sentence. You know, because you have a life sentence and nobody goes home on the life sentence. Especially so, at that point in time. You know? What was that feeling like when you got the sentence? I know it was kind of, we're backtracking a little bit, but what was that like at 17, right? Um, 18. 18. I was already, well, I was litigating for 15 months. So I was already 18 years old. Yeah. Uh, going on 19. Um, I'm not going to lie to you, bro. It was, I didn't, I, I didn't care. I really didn't. You know, I, I swear I was in Norwalk court. Which is what's one of the worst. They call it no to, walk. They call it no walk, right? Yeah. Uh, I was one of. The, I was in there, and I used to see these guys come in bawling, bro, crying, like oh, they just got stretched out. And I'm like, what's up with this fool? Like, yeah. what the fuck? Come on, fool, you know what you signed up for? Let's do this shit. You know, it is what it is. You've landed, um, but it didn't. It didn't phase me. I remember my when because I got, bro, my trial land was three days, and they delivered it the same day, in the morning. 
Jeez. right? They convicted my co-defendant in the afternoon. So I remember him going up there, and they found him guilty too. And I remember him coming home, and he, I mean, coming down from the, to the tank. from the thing to the tank, and he's like, he was laughing. He goes, "Oh, I guess we're gonna be bunkies, fool." They got us, and wow, it was like funny. Wow, it really was. Yeah. But in my mind, it's like I didn't do this. So like, I always felt like my conscience was clear because I didn't do this crime. But there's part of you that you mentioned that you still felt like you deserved to be there. So. You know, like to be in prison, you know what I mean? Not mm -hmm. guilty of that crime. Can you touch on that a bit? Like sure. what you meant by that? So, um, the first 15 years of my incarceration, well, I was very angry. I was very anti social. I was very, you know, it was everybody else's fault but mine. That's just the way I was living. Yeah. Right? I was still selfish. I was still irresponsible. Even though I managed to fly under the radar and I was staying out of trouble, uh, you know, and I was just, you know, uh, uh, Living in prison, sure. Um, you know, I was still, I still had those those uh, character defects that I that I, and I was very irresponsible and selfish with my family. Yeah, yeah. So, I went from a level four prison to a level three to a level two. So when I got to a level two, which is solid debt state prison, uh -huh. um, I got introduced to self help therapy, right? Like got CGA. It. Yeah, yeah. Right. And um, when I got introduced to it, they're like, "Oh, this is what lifers are supposed to be taking." So they can go home and in my mind I'm like well I didn't do my crime so those are, those groups are for people that actually did their crimes like if I ever go home I'm going home I'm going home through the courts yeah right through appeal and um, and I said so those groups ain't for me right during that time take it the guy that had testified against me in court that said that I was driving the vehicle actually retracted his testimony wow so trip on this so um because even though my family fought for me, bro, they fought for my mother. Can, she fought for me day and night, mm -hmm. right? Whether with lawyers, whether with private investigators. And, and this is what I mean about me being irresponsible and selfish. Because instead of me saying, you know what? My, my parents, they're spending a lot of money on these, these lawyers. and Maybe I should focus on that. Right, focus on this and stop focusing on what's going on in here and focus on this so I can get myself home. But my mentality was, well, I have a lawyer and I have a private lawyer, so I don't need to help him. Yeah, they're doing the Let work him do for his you. work and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and eventually they're going to call my name and I'm going to go home. That's, that's the way I was seeing stuff. And that's what I mean about me still being selfish, selfish and irresponsible. And and, yeah, yeah, and, right? And so, you felt, but you still felt because of just, I mean, a lot of people are selfish, but you think that was enough to make you deserving of a 33 year sentence? Or no, year not sentence? yet. Not, we're we're going to get to that part. Got it. So in 2004, yeah. 2003, my. my my mother hires this, this last attorney, right? And this attorney uh, comes up to visit me. I was in Sentinel State Prison. He comes up to visit me and he tells me, look, bro. He's like, look, man, just I'm your lawyer. I'm your paid lawyer. Whatever you tell me, just tell me the truth. And I told him the truth. I go, look, man, this is what happened. This is what went down. Boom, boom, boom. He's like, okay, cool. Where is this guy at? Do you know where this guy Timothy is at? Do you know where he's at? And I'm like, I honestly don't know. He goes, can you find him? I says, well, at that time, I still had a little connections with my neighborhood in the street. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let me see, right? Boom, they ended up finding this guy. So my parents pick him up, and they tell him, look, man, all we need you to do is just tell the truth. Just tell, I don't care what happened in 1991. All we care about is my son coming home. Just tell the truth, right? He ends up going to the lawyer's office. The lawyer was named uh, James Hodges. And, uh, and, st and, th and this is where I believe that he went wrong. If he would have filmed them, he would have had it on film. But mm -hmm. because he just had a conversation with them, and he, and he told them this is what happened. So when we were litigating our, our case to the courts, right, this guy gets arrested. This the guy, guy that was testified against that was you. testifying gets arrested. So the day that we're going to court, this is how, you know, this is how the universe works, right? Yeah. So the day we're going to court, he's... Uh, we're walking with one of his homeboys and we're going to court. And, you know, he was black. So yeah. we're like, hey, bro, man, what's up with your homeboy? He's, he's going to court. He's saying that me and old boy did this. Like, what's up? He's like, what? He's like, yeah, man, he's going to court. Like, he's literally going to court saying, this is why we're here right now. And he's like, oh, man, well, I'm going to look into it and this and this and that. So we get to the county jail. He goes his way. We go ours. Next thing you know, he tells us, hey, man, this dude, 
you're talking about is in the next tank right here. He's like, what? He's like, yeah, he's in the next tank. Yeah. So me and my co-defendant look at each other. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's on. We're getting this fool. You know, I'm young. I'm naive. I'm still in that life. So, yeah, he's, this dude's done, right? We're going to catch him right now on the bus or whatever, and he's done. He's not going to testify no more. Yeah. So um, he ends up going on the first bus to Norwalk Court, right? And we're in the second one. So I remember the bus driver going through the street, and I'm like, why is he going through the street? He's usually... He take the freeway there and comes out that the, the bus that he was on got stuck in the freeway. It was a car accident. So we get to the court in Norwalk and it's already like really late. So they take off the cuffs and they tell us, hey man, you know, you got to go to your floor because yeah. whatever. And now we're like, oh man, this dude's going to get away. He's going to get away. And sure enough, we go up to our thing and uh, when we come back down, he's gone. He's in the attorney room. I don't know if his name came up. I don't know if he said something. I don't know what happened. Yeah. But they snatched him off the line and they put him in there. So that goes that, right? And all we went to court for was just to get postponed. Tell us come back in three months. So we end up seeing his homeboy and we're on the bus and we're having a conversation in the bus just like we are right now. Mm-hmm. And guess who's walking out of the door going into the bus, right? The dude. Timothy. So we're like, oh, snap, there he is. He's coming in the bus. He goes, hey, have a conversation with him. See what he tells you. So me and my homeboy are sitting in a chair like this, right? And I, I'm over here. And, and again, like, this is after you got sentenced and you're... No, this, no, this is still... Oh, this is before. While okay. we're litigating so he, the case. Okay, I didn't know. Okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, while it. we're litigating the, 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 the charges. Got it. So he says, um, okay, let me have a conversation with him. So he gets in the bus. They put him in the cage. And then he, and he sees him. Hey, Tim. And he turns around, and he's like, what's up, man? Oh, hey, what's up? And then, you know, they have like a little reu- mini reunion. And then he starts telling me, hey, man, what's this I hear you about you telling these boys from this gang? Like, what's going on? He's like, no, that's, that's not me. He's like, are you sure? Because the word on the street is that you're telling all these dudes on the murder, bro. And that's not even cool. And he's like, hey, man, that's not me. Like, no, that's not me. And he goes, well, do you recognize his face? And then my co-defendant pulled his face out like this. And the dude is looking back, his shackle is looking back, and he just puts his uh, face forward, and he just puts his head down. And he goes, hey, man, you know, you got to do the right thing, bro. You know it wasn't these guys, so you, like, what are you doing? Damn. Like, why are you testifying against these dudes? Well, well I'm going to tell them that I don't know. Just tell them the truth. Yeah. Right. Right. That is not them. That's it. You don't have to Did lie or nothing. Just tell the truth. Did you ever find out why he was lying? Huh? Did you ever find out why he lied? So okay. this is this is how you, this is how the story this is where the story gets juicy, right? So, um, so according to him, he's like, "Hey man, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna test. I'm not do it." So we're like, "Oh, that's it," because that's all they have is this dude right here. So we end up going to trial. <laughs> he pops up in the stand, and we're like, "What the? What happened with this dude? I thought he wasn't gonna test." And he's like, "Yeah, the driver, the shooter." Wow. Yeah. And boom, pointing at you, right? Court. Yeah. Sure. So, again, years pass now. Years pass. Two thousand four. You know, we uh, the lawyer they get a hold of this guy. He's talks. He tells finally tells the truth. So what happened was, he did tell the he did tell the the DA that he was that it wasn't us. Yeah. That you know that he wanted to testify. He just didn't want to, no part of this case anymore. And they threatened him. The cops threatened him. And I have the affidavit at home where he's saying. The cops told me, if you don't testify against these guys, then we're going to get you for a conspiracy to commit murder. Which means you set this guy because he was walking with the kid that got killed. Got it. So we're going to get you for conspiracy. And then you're going to have life. And we're going to say that you set him up to get him killed. And yada, yada, yada. So the guy got scared and he did what he did. We didn't know none of this, bro. We didn't know none of this. But again, because I'm still being irresponsible and selfish, I'm not focused on this case. Jeez. And even though the lawyer did the right thing with the affidavit, he botched the case. At the end of the day, he botched the case. Went on to like two thousand, I don't know, a few years. Okay. Finally, the the, the 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 federal court said, "Man, we're not even going to see your case because everything is late. Everything that your attorney filed was late." And anyways, that's when I said, "Okay, this is it." I told my parents, "You know what? No more money. No more lawyers. No more nothing. If if I'm ever going to come home, it's going to be me." I have to. Start. So I remember going to um, to one of my first self help groups with my buddy, mm-hmm. and I remember putting my story together. 
And well, I take it back. It was a task. That was a task for 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 you to put your story together. To like write your life story. Yeah, to write your life story. So I get to the point where I'm 16, and my house is getting shot up, right, by my so-called rival gangs. Yeah, this is part of that glorious gang life that you're part of, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not telling my parents anything. Every time they come up to me, tell me, "Hey, what are you involved in? What's what's going on? Like, what are you doing?" Because well, so like, I was literally you're, living a double life. Yeah, you're just like nothing. What are you talking yeah. about? Wait, so I, your house is getting shot up, and your parents are like, "What's going on?" You're like, it's "Yeah, me. like, hey, man, no this idea. is hey, this is where we live. This is the norm right here. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, right?" And I would get defensive, and I would storm out. Okay. Right, and all the threats in the world weren't working because at that time already, I was so knee deep into the gang that that was too late for them to try to threaten me with sending me to Mexico or send me to with your my aunt and Pomo, like wherever they were trying to send me, I was going to come back. Mm-hmm. You know, it didn't matter because sure. every, my neighborhood was everything to me. It was everything to me. So um, they were like, uh, so the first time, right? And uh, my house, the second time, third time. So now I'm, I'm thinking, because now I'm a lot older, right? And I'm like, wait a minute, what? It, it made sense to me at 16 not to say nothing to my parents. But why is it not making sense to me now that I'm an adult, mm-hmm. that I'm in my 30s, you know? And that's when I says, you know what, man, I do belong here. Like, sure. I do belong in prison. I says, because, wait a minute, what if at one of those times that, that they shot up my house, that they would have hit my mom or my dad or my sister? Like, where would I be at right now? Like, how can I look at myself in the mirror and call myself a man? Mm-hmm. Because I did that. It wasn't them. I did it. You know, because so you're addicted that to age, that lifestyle that, that brought that to your front door. Yeah, yeah and, but and, that, that's a revolutionary thought, though, to have. Like, I would even say, from my experiences and the things I, I believe in and hold true near, near and dear to my heart, is that that thought, I mean, it seems like you were starting to do some of the work, but I feel like that thought is from that's a spiritual thought to even see that side of the coin, especially when you only saw one side of the coin for so long. Yeah. And well, that's when I realized I said that I knew that something was wrong with me, because I I couldn't live my whole life blaming other people for the stuff that and I and that's what you that were I doing was, that essentially I was, always. Yeah, I was pointing the pushing the blame at everybody else ex- instead of me accepting and responsibility. And that's honestly what got you into that lifestyle. That gay yeah. lifestyle was placing blame and pointing exactly. fingers. Exactly. Because and I, here you again, are years later. Nobody cared about me, right? So or so you thought. You know, yeah. Yeah. You know so. But it wasn't true. Yeah, it was just yeah. stuff that I was making up as a kid, you know, sure. kids. So now I'm like, okay, well maybe. And I started digging, and it's like a, it's like a, like an onion, you know. You peel the layers back. Yeah. Right? You peel the layers until you get to the core issues of what, of what was going on inside of me, and that's how I came to the realization that I was so angry, bro. I was so angry at my parents. I was so angry at, at my family. You know, uh, I remember when I got arrested, I wasn't talking to my dad, I wasn't talking to my sister, and I was barely talking to my mom. Mm-hmm. But when I got arrested, they were all there. Like, they were all there. And I was like, hey, man, I didn't do this. So, like, you know? So, I mean, so like, you're in the streets, and all you're doing is talking to your homeboys. And you think yeah. they're the ones that are there for you. And then when shit got real for you, if the script is flipped, and yeah. now you're just only talking to your family. Yeah. Now it's, now it's you, know, it, you know, but now you're in a predicament where now you got to get yourself out of this. Right? So, again, um, I realized that there was something wrong with me that I need to start doing the work. And I did. And I started real. like, what, what, what got me most is the remorse, right? The, the, the remorse aspect, because even I've shared my story a lot of times. Yeah. And every time I share that story about my family, like my house getting shot up and what could have happened, it still messes me up a little bit. It really does, you know, um, right. because I'm, I'm blessed, you know. And then God didn't turn his back on me. He actually saved me, you know. He saved me because... I honestly believe if I don't get arrested for this crime, I'm dead right now. I'm not even here, bro. Yeah, we're not because, having this combo. Because I was at war. Like, I, it wasn't like, oh, I got beef with this hood. If we catch ourselves slipping, then it's what. No, we were like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So um, I never made plans for the future because I never believed I was going to pass 20 years old. Uh-huh. I knew eventually I was going to die, you know. Uh, so nothing mattered to me. Um, so when I began doing the work and I seen... What was what happened with me? All I wanted to do was help other people figure some stuff out within themselves. You know, um, I began to involve myself. You know, begin being a facilitator, being part of groups, and just growing. And how many years in the prison is this? Is this process starting? You said you're 15 years. You're in there in the same mentality, right? I just want to make sure mm-hmm. I'm keeping up with it properly. So same mentality. 
be putting in work in prison, part of any gang life, or like what's like it, it, it's 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 going pretty poorly, or like how did you even get to that point where you made the decision to start? So when I I was in really le- like yeah when I was in level two, it was a lot yeah, easier yeah. for me to change, right? Um, one of the things that I believe that it was it was a uh, it was a uh, it was a little difficult to let go of was what the, was the identity that I had created for myself, right? Sure. So I, was, I had a nickname, and the nickname was, that's who I was. That's who I identified as. Yeah. So now I have to cut ties with that nickname and that whole reputation that you established with that nickname and go back to being Caesar. But well, who is Caesar? Yeah, what's your identity? Yeah, you know, I only identified this for so long, and this is all I knew how to do. So I had to really learn how to live as Caesar now. But in order for me to live as Caesar, I had to figure out what was wrong with me. I had to figure out what was going on inside of me emotionally, right, spiritually. So that's how those, when I used the, 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 the layers with the onion, yeah, yeah. I peeled it all the way down to, 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 to the center of it where I figured out, okay, this was my core issues, abandonment issues, self-esteem issues. So now I began working on those. When before I didn't believe in myself, today I do believe in myself. Of course. Right? When before um, I felt like nobody cared about me, that wasn't true. That was all, I was just, it was just my mind playing tricks on me, bro. 100%. You know? And when you're in a, you know, so... Again, you, you were able to have the opportunity to start peeling back the onion, so to speak, because a level four yard is the highest level, then three, and then you drop the two. So I'm yes. sure it's a little less violent, a little less political, and they probably offered those programs, and you're just like, fuck it, I'm going to try it out. Yes, absolutely. And absolutely. did you believe it was going to work, or did you do it for different reasons? Like In the beginning, so here's, here's, a, here's the thing, right? So I began doing all this work, right? But I wasn't really internalizing the work. Got it. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. Like, I wasn't really internalizing. I was doing everything that they wanted me to do, right? Yeah, conceptually. You were trying to do it to look good, essentially? Yes. Not to actually improve yourself. So it wasn't really in here. It was just uh, uh, externally, right? I have all these certificates, all these chronos, all these attaboy chronos. Uh So when I go to the board, I'm going to go home. Mm -hmm. Because I'm bringing these people what they want to see, right? And then in the exchange, I'm going to get my freedom back, and I'm going to be able to come back home. So I go to my first parole board hearing in 2012. Mm-hmm. And I remember I, I thought I was ready. I'm like, I'm going in there. I'm going to get my date and I'm going to go home. Right? And it was a three hour, three and a half hour hearing. And I get denied. You know, they hit me with five years. Right? I mean, I had just got caught with the cell phone two years prior. Yeah. Right? So that had a lot to do with it. But nothing was internalized. Mm-hmm. So in, in, I'm in those meetings, I imagine, like, they know. Of they're, course. They're in there talking to you, seeing your mannerisms, how you... Uh, of course. I mean, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just imagining, right? So like, they know that the work that you did was on paper. You have the accolades, but internally you're not ready to go back out there. Absolutely. So, so what they see is these commissioners are, are ex-law you know, law enforcement, right? So they, they can smell it a mile away, right? If, 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 the, if the change is real, they can see it. And if you're trying to manipulate your way out of the situation, then they can see it also. Yeah. So I honestly believed that by me doing all this work that I was doing, college, self-help, facilitating, that was going to get me home. But nothing was here. I just had it. Yeah. I had this stuff, but nothing was in here. And it took the commissioner at the end when he gave me that five-year denial to tell me, he goes, Mr. Zuniga, you're on the right track. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. But what you're, what you're not doing is you're not internalizing the, the material that you're facilitating and that you're taking. And I'm like, what? What does that mean? He's like, yeah, you're not living it. You're supposed to live the 12 steps. You're supposed to live Avatar. You're supposed to live the stuff that you're talking about. You're just having a conversation about, it's like taking a class and I quiz you yeah. and you pass the quiz, but it's not really here. Yeah, there's right? the, the spirituality, the way that you live it is that it's based in principles, yes. right? And so we can have this conversation all day, right? But if you're not, if you're not internalizing, and I'll give you an example. I remember and we lived together for a while. Um, I mean, I, I remember I woke up your roommate one day and he didn't come back because mm-hmm. he overdosed off a little something that I gave him. And I remember, you know, and here we are now sitting as, as change recovered man. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, thank God that we're both able to be here and that I made it out as well because I was, I was wild in my own regards. But yeah, doing, doing the work, right? So I was three months sober. I, uh, I was selling Coke at the time. And I had, like you said, conceptually I understand the spirituality, right? But how, how can you be living with spiritual principles mm-hmm. if you're off selling 
bags oh. of coke to people that are struggling and suffering, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember I, it was the one time I didn't even want to do it and I love drugs and I knew I was onto something at that point something's happening but I remember I called somebody and I said I've never felt so miserable in my life I'm four blocks from the beach I have a brand new car um, I have a job that I just got hired for um, but I'm doing this old activity yeah. and he's like yeah. once you start once you really engage in a spiritual way of life and you embody principles Doing that stuff won't even be an option anymore, and I think that that's what you're what, what you're saying. And yeah. the truth is, is internalizing it for me is being honest and vulnerable with another yeah. man or other people, letting people know my deepest and darkest secrets, letting people know and putting my fears on paper and seeing why I have them. Mm -hmm. I have the fears because you know, it's some way or another, I can't accomplish those things, or I'm not relying on something bigger than me, which I do believe in. But if I'm still relinquishing kind of that power and control then i'm not believing in that aspect of my life and that yeah. creates the fear and you know what that five year denial was the best thing that could happen to me mm -hmm. um, because like i said uh that commissioner was able to the commissioner was able to point stuff out in me that i couldn't see because a lot of times you need someone to be really brutally honest with you 100%. to tell you right like hey man you have anger issues brother like hey you have road rage issues bro like sure. what's going on here so at that time i believe i had everything figured out but when this, when I got slapped with the five years, I was like five years, and then he. So one of my character defects is what? Well, I didn't, I wasn't hearing what I wanted to hear, so I shut down, right? Mm -hmm. And I started making up all this stuff in my mind about like, oh, they're not trying to let us go, you know, these these fools are full of shit, they don't care, fuck these people. So I started making up all this stuff in my mind about them, and 30 days later, I get my transcripts. You know, and I became the victim, right? Because I started sharing my victim story with all my peers everyone. in prison. Oh, man, you know, I did everything. I did man. everything, and they didn't want to let me go. That's fucking bullshit. Yada, yada, yada. So then I get my transcripts, and my, and my really close friends, I was like, hey, man, treat my, read my stuff, bro. Because according to me, I had the, I had the perfect hearing. And yeah. I don't even know why I'm still here. Yeah. I should have been home, right? Yeah. So uh, they read my transcripts, and they're like, bro, it's right here, black and white. Like, you have to internalize this stuff. It says right here. Like, you're doing the right thing. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, what does internalize mean? I thought it was just, you know, call me naive. But I thought it was just do the groups, share it with them that you've done the groups, and then you get your date and you go home. What do you mean? He goes, no, you have to live it, brother. Like, you have to literally live this stuff that you're, that you're taking. And I'm like, what? You know? So during that time, I get transferred over to Folsom. I, go, I end up in Old Folsom. Uh -huh. Now this is a level two also. But it's a high, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a high power level two where every other day people were getting molly whopped, mm -hmm. right? Uh, everybody there was angry and bitter. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, why do, and again, right? Because now I have a spiritual foundation. Now I'm, I'm a believer in, now I have, you know, God in me and I'm back with God and we're good and sure. he's doing all these great things for me. And now I'm like questioning like, what the fuck? Like, why did you send me here? The yard is about as big as this room, <laughs> right? And uh, the people don't even fit. They're like sardines in there. And it's hot and it's miserable and everybody's angry. And, you know, um, so I'm like, man, what? And every day I'm thinking, like, why the fuck am I here? Like, what the hell's going on here? Like, how does this work? But I have all this, all these groups under my belt that I have brought with me that I had acquired and solid that. Yeah. So I'm like, well, you know what, man? Well, maybe if I start a little something here, you know? And CGA is like my bread and butter, right? Yeah. CGA for the, our audience is Criminals and Gangers Anonymous. Yeah. And um, I, got, I got together with a few friends that were in Solidarity with me. And, and we they began were also making an old moves. With you? Yes, we began making moves trying to get this group off the ground. Yeah. And uh, we did. We did. Oh, and so then, you guys brought the group and like kind yeah, of some of the CGA stuff? Yeah, because CGA was they, not they had, they had nothing there in Folsom. No. So you're like, yo, this the is a good thing, idea to bring this here. The only thing that they had in Folsom was AA, NA, and Celebrate and Recovery. That's it. That's the only self-help groups. And people were going to these groups, and they just weren't even going for the group. They just wanted to they get out. They were just going to hang out and get seat. a chrono, yeah. and that was it. Right? So now CGA comes along, and I get all these people involved. And, man, to this day, it's, it's up and running. It's changing lives. But the difference between then and now is that when I was told by my peers I needed to internalize it, it was different now. Mm -hmm. Now I'm living this stuff. Now whatever group that I'm involved in is here. It's not external. It's internal. It's right here. So 
in 2015, I get the opportunity to go to another hearing, um, and I walk in there, and everything that they're asking me, I'm just hitting out of the ballpark. Really? I'm just like, bam, 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 bam. And, you know, three and a half hour hearing, 45 minute deliberation, and I remember my lawyer telling me, she's like, man, you're good. And I was like, are you sure? Because they're taking forever, man. Like, yeah. man, you're good. Like, she didn't really say nothing. And how many years have you been incarcerated at this point in time? At that time, I was already in my 25th year. Got it. Right. So, uh, sure enough, the commissioners come back. Uh, they they acknowledge the fact that I was able to get CGA off the ground in Folsom. They gave me a lot of credit for that, and I was given my freedom back, bro. I was given my freedom back in 2015, November. Um, you know, it was unreal. I remember I, I, as soon as I heard him, I, I saw. I remember he came back in. He says, "You know what? We feel like you're no longer a third society, so we're gonna find you suitable." And man, the the water the water works yeah. just happened, I'm, I'm sure. right? No and the, my, my lawyer's telling me to calm down. I don't hear nothing else but that, bro. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm crying. I got all this snot coming out, and <laughs> you know, and then I, all they have is like those brown paper towels, and just, yeah. um, I'm trying to blow my nose. I'm trying to clean my eyes, and and every time it just kept getting more real and more real, and more real. So every time it got more real, I just kept crying. And I remember the commissioner's telling me, he says, "Look, man." Um, he said, if I was you, I would just keep this to myself. I wouldn't tell none of these guys out here because, you know, you never know, man. I'm like, what? And then I had, so I had made friends and I had made connections with every single race mm -hmm. in Folsom, which is something that it's rare to do. But I sure. did it because I really internalized this work and a lot of people were coming to me to help them with this board preparation, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody was looking forward to hearing the news that I was going to get because yeah, it was like a big deal. if this guy is going to go to board and he's gonna, not going to talk about his crime, but he's going to accept responsibility for his actions for the crime. And if he goes home, that means I'm, I can go home. So I remember, oh. I remember going out to the yard and it was like, you know, in these prison yards, you throw a piece of bread, man, and all the birds come try to kill each other for one piece of bread, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's how I felt when I walked out there. Everybody came to me, what happened, what happened? I was like, I'm gone, man, I'm gone. Oh, so you ended up I got the it, truth. I got the grant. And they were like, what, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah. So uh, there were every single race in all Folsom, every from blacks, Asians, whites, Mexicans, they were all super, super happy for me. Um, I remember the last day that I was there, I was in the phone line to make sure that my folks were going up there to go pick me up. Um, uh, the dude that was running the yard right there, you know, he was behind me, and he comes up to me and tells me, hey, man, you know, uh, if anybody deserves to go home uh, from this yard, he goes, it's you. You know, it's you. He said, uh, I says, man, you could go home, too. I, I'm not the exception to the rule, man. I, I just didn't get lucky, bro. I did the work. I said, and you could do the work, too. And, you could, and he's like, no, you know, it's, it's too late for me. I go, it's never too late. It's never too late. Well, it's because, you know, I'm right here. I got this. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I said, you can give it back. And I so said, you can give it back, bro. It's around that, that time, and Shane and I were discussing, just wanted to touch on this. It sounds like you went from a life that, that lacked quite a bit of purpose and no direction to like finding purpose. Like, what, how, how, was that that moment, or after you got released, were you, did you really just start discovering more purpose? Like, how did that work? No, the, I believe the purpose came when I figured it out. Right? Inside it purpose. was like but Pandora. What, is that, what does that look like? People, people always say all the time, like, you know, you hear it in society, you need to find your purpose, you need to find meaning. I've, I know what that is for me. Mm -hmm. I know what my, my calling and, and part of my purpose, but what, what did that feel like and look like to you, so, right? So for me, I honestly believe that I was brought into the, this world to become a gang member. That's what I thought, like, like when I, I, I was made for it, right? Because I wasn't good at sports and I wasn't good at school, but I was really good at being a gang member. Like, that was my shit. Mm -hmm. Right, like that was it. But when I discovered that I was really good, I was doing at at this at the self help and figuring stuff out, right, and 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 peeling those layers back. Man, I knew that that wasn't my calling. That my calling was for me to be of service. My calling was for me to help others, mm -hmm. right? Figure some stuff out, like I figured it out, mm -hmm. you know. And not by telling them what to do, but to to guide them. Um, and when I figured that out, I was like, oh, man, this is what I love doing. Like, this is what I really like doing. Like, I put myself on the back burner, yeah. right? And I, and I allowed other people to go ahead of me, whoever it was. Um, and I humbled myself. And I was just like, you know what? Um, the first thing that I have to let go of, 
understand is that it's no longer about me. It cannot be about me anymore. Because if it's about me, then it's just me being selfish. Mm -hmm. It's about what I can do for you. Well, look, 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 at, look at what got, it got where you got from yeah. being about you, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, the work that you do and, and experiences that I've had in my life to see... Um, First of all, other people, before I saw it, because I'm so hard on myself, I think a lot of us are, but me, I'm very, very hard on myself. Other people saw the change in me before I saw it in myself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that type of internal work that you were talking about, like, radiates from, from us as human beings. Mm -hmm. And then to see people look at you as a source of hope, and then, like you said, to be a guide them, right? To show mm -hmm. them what you did, and then to see them having success and getting their life in order... For me to even talk about the experiences I've, I've had would be really to marginalize it. I can't mm. put it into words. You, but, you know, I went to the shuv about about a year and a half ago, I think. Maybe about a year ago, year and a half ago. Carrie asked me to go over there and speak. And I remember... I there love was a, Carrie. There was Shout a former, out to Carrie. Yeah, She's there was wonderful. a former lifer there at the shuv, right? Um, this guy had just got exonerated. Um, you know, he... he uh, some law helped us. Uh, called 1437, the felony murder rule, mm -hmm. uh, helped him come home because he, you know, he was a lifer. So um, he was in the audience. I shared my story, and when they were doing a Q and A, I remember him asking me. He goes, "Hey man, that sounds like a board story." And I says, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Yeah, it sounds like you would, you took responsibility because of the board because you wanted to come home because you like you weren't really innocent." And I said, "No." I said, I was a gang member when I was a criminal, and I know what I brought to my home that could have had my family killed, mm -hmm. right? And I needed to take responsibility for that. I couldn't sit there and just say, hey, man, I was innocent, and now like, the, who I was, what I was part of, what I was representing is what caused this dude to die. So, yes, I am responsible. I have to take responsibility for that. And not only that, but look what I was bringing to my home. Huh. My parents had nothing to do with that. They were hardworking people, and I was bringing that to my home. Right, so every chance that I get, I, I could never ever repay, fully repay what my mom did for me. Mm. My mom gave her, her, you know, she gave up her life for me, right? Um, so I can never repay it. All I can do is continue being a better person, continue to give back, continue to be humble, continue to to stay grounded, um, you know, and and continue to to do good, because I don't ever want to break her heart again. I don't ever want to have her. You know, oh, my son's in jail again. Oh, my son's... Like, I don't ever want to sure. do that. All I want to hear is like, oh, man, you know, he's doing good. He's doing this. He's doing that. You know, uh, he's, he's, he's doing it. He's making it out here. How's your relationship with your family members today? It's great, man. My sister and my mother are my biggest supporter. Uh, my girl, you know, my biggest, biggest supporters. Uh, you know, I... I you know, I, I'm today. I'm just. I, I live, bro. I live every weekend. I find something to do. I see yeah, you on there, man. The You're out yeah. there on, on the more beach, I'm doing. mobbing it's around, good. hanging yeah. out with friends. I'm doing biking. stuff. I'm doing stuff that I never done in my life. Um, you know, before when I was a gang member and I was living out here, I was always looking over my shoulder. I was always strapped. You know, I I, I was I used to rob myself. Well, I can't go over there because them guys are over there. I can't go over here because these guys were. So I lived in my own little square. Yeah, sure. And I would never leave that square. And every time I used to leave that square, I used to take something with me to make sure that I felt protected, like a gun or a knife or something. You know, because my mentality was that you're never gonna catch me slipping. Of course. Because my homie got caught slipping, and look at him, he's six feet under. Because mm -hmm. he got caught. That was his bad. So that ain't going to happen to me. So um, today, um, I don't look over my shoulder. And I today, do you do anything, some important bro. work. You know, we, talk, we touched on the discovering purpose aspect, and Shane gave his anecdotes about that and how he presents that to the world as well. But you're doing, I guess we also talked about this, but I wanted you to bring it back up. The organization you work for, we've had someone on there. We've had Joel from ARC mm -hmm. on here. But you do something a bit different, and I think it's absolutely wild. And so you actually, again, you discover the purpose, but now you've been maintaining that purpose and building upon it. Just tell everyone what it is exactly you're doing now. So in 2017, I joined what at ARC is called the Hope and Redemption Team. Okay. So it was a pilot program back then. They didn't know if it was going to work. Okay. They didn't know. All they knew is they needed some former lifers uh, to make that peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, make it happen, because that's the only make way. Make what happen. Um, to figure out a way to get through to these guys in prison. Okay, got right? it. Right? Like, no disrespect to either one of you, but yeah, if yeah. one of you guys went in there, you never lived a life, but you try to go in there and teach a, 
a board a board prep class or a CGA. They're gonna be like, like, who the hell is this? Yeah, like where'd you learn this from? Oh, I, I agree with you. you like know? you need. And we talked about it on another show that yeah. we want to. For me, like it didn't work to not speak to somebody that had the same experience as me. Yeah, I couldn't just get like, help just from a therapist at first. Like you know, then someone that's like never done drugs, never. I mean, I've only done six months in jail, but never, never been in trouble with the law, never humiliated himself, never hurt their family, never did any of these terrible things. And they're going to tell me how to change my life. But when I see someone like Shane, who has the exact same story as I do and it causes the same sort of damage, and he's like, this is how it's done, I'm more inclined to listen to what the fuck he's saying. And I'll tell you why, though, in my, what, what I think why is because in the beginning, I didn't trust anybody. Yeah, same. So if you don't really do the things I used to get down with, there's auto, there's immediately a barrier of trust. And I just, I shut down, you mm-hmm. know, I didn't, I didn't have the tools. Uh, I wasn't able to work on myself until yeah, I was. Exactly. But, most of the time I like get ther- in a therapy setting, I'm being like forced into therapy. Like I got to go to treatment to go to therapy or your family's pushing you this and that, whatever. But like when you have a peer to peer type of situation, you're more, again, more inclined to start listening to these people because they've been in your shoes. So that goes back to what you're saying. Some white dude coming in there, it's like spent six months in counting. They're like, you don't laugh at me. Like what the fuck do you know, dude? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck are you saying And the thing me? is this, bro. I was put to the ringer. You were. 100%. I was put to the ringer. Uh, when I went to my board hearing, yeah. you know, uh, I'll, you, you have to be honest and transparent sure. and I was honest and transparent with them and that's why I got my freedom yeah. so the work that I do today is I, I go back into maximum security prisons yeah. you know, not no level 2 no and level this one. is called the Hope and Redemption Team for the Anti-Recidivism Coalition yes got it right so we go back in there and a lot of these guys have you know some of them have been in, in prison for 20-30 years um, Barry's starting to figure some stuff out uh, still believe that the lifestyle is, is, is their calling, mm-hmm. right? And uh, one thing that I always tell them, first and foremost, when I introduce myself to them, I always share my story of what happened with me. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times, I remember when we first did our very first groups in there and some of the guys were walking in, you know, you know, in the level four, everybody has a mask, right? Everybody wears a mask. So everybody walks in there with their mask and, um, and they see me with the tie, and they're like, who's this dude? Like, who the fuck is this guy, right? Sure. And then, uh, you know, I introduce myself to the group, and that's first and foremost, I tell them what I'm here to do. I tell them about the organization. I says, you know, and then some of them are still just like laying there, just looking at me like, who the fuck is this guy, right? And then I start sharing my story. And then they, as I share my story, and they, I tell them, and you can see them like, oh, snap, this guy, what? A lifer, he's a lifer. And he's still on parole? And they let you back in here? Like, well, yeah. wait a minute. How does that even work? Yeah, you started this work when you were still on parole. I was and, on and parole. That, and for people that don't know, you're, I mean, you can't go into institutions when you're on probation or parole, correct? Yeah, you can't. That's you know? not a thing. Or with the background of being charged with murder. Yeah, right. right? Or a background of being a gang member. Like, who does that? Yeah. But, um, you know, the a- ARC is a, a very powerful organization that makes a lot of moves, and they made it happen. And this team has been very successful for the last three years. So what uh, do you guys do? So you said it's a pilot program. This is three years later, so it's obviously more than a pilot program. Now it's an actual legitimate program. You guys are traveling prison to prison throughout the state of California. and bringing- No, we're only in eight prisons right now. Okay, eight prisons right? is a lot. Though. Eight prisons out of 35, it's not that many. No? Wish, I wish we could be in all of them. I wish we had a team that, is that the goal? we could send. Um, no, the goal is for us to shut some of these prisons down. Really? That's the goal. The goal is to get as many people home as possible that deserve to be home, right? Because they've changed. Uh-huh. Um, because first and foremost, what we believe in is, is uh, uh, public safety. Bottom line. I tell them all the time. I says, look, I love you as an individual. Yeah. I says, but if you're going to be my neighbor, I want you to be rehabilitated. I don't need this moniker, this where you're from. I don't need that yeah. next door to me. Because I don't care for that. I'm here to help you to get home to your family. They haven't killed that character like you killed that character. Your nickname, that that, yes. that whole that whole character. Yeah, I always tell him the dude that I was is dead and buried, and he's never gonna come back up, bro. He's on top of ten tons of concrete, right? He's never gonna come back up. So, with bringing these uh, programs into the prisons, I mean, you're you're actually helping bring people home. Yes. Correct. Yes, we've brought. There's there's been, and I tell the guys all the time. This is no lie, and not, and I'm trying to make it sound, uh, you know, but we do this much, like really, really little. I think our presence, that's it. You know, I tell the guys all the time, man, if, when I was in prison, and if I seen a lifer come back in here, just by me seeing a lifer come back into, that's all I needed to see. 
That's all I needed to see for me to believe that, you know what, that could be me too. That's it. Yeah, tell me what I got to yeah, do, what I need to do. Because we're not doing the work for them. They're doing it. They deserve all the credit. These guys are coming home and they're like, oh, no, because of you. Because... No, it's not us. Yeah. We could go in there with no material, no curriculum, no nothing, just in the flesh. Just and, because you And they fit, see yeah. us and that's all it takes for some. Right, because they're so, more apt to listen, like he was saying. Like, what the fuck do I have to do? That's when people start listening. Yes, because they want to do something, not because they have to do something. There's still something to be said, though. I, I mean, I want to acknowledge you because you were locked up for a long time, yeah. and you know, it, it sounds like you found your purpose and your passion when you were still in there. And now you're able to make a living out of it, and it's a job, and it's more than a job. Mm -hmm. You live for it, and you mm -hmm. love to to see people come back out and be productive members of society but you could have gone and chased money and did things and feel like you you missed out on you know a lot of things and you stuck to really the path that's yeah. that's been you're you're really your your savior I, I honestly believe that this is where god has me right now that's beautiful right um god has other open double doors for me but i believe that this is where i need to be right now um you know for how long who knows Right for yeah. right now, that's where I'm at, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I believe making those relationships with with the staff, like with the wardens and the yeah. captains and the lieutenants, when they see us walk into the prison and they're like, "Hey, man!" and they like, they don't even remember that we were arrested for murder or that we were gang members. They don't remember none of that. All yeah. there is like, "Hey, man, how's the group going? How's everything going? Do you guys need anything? How's it?" Right? Yeah. And that's a that's a beautiful feeling because they really don't judge you. Yeah. And so it all took, those years you're being treated like property and they and did it judge took, you. But it took us it took a, about a year for us to gain that trust because we oh. had to prove to them that, you know, come on. Bro, the the warden is gonna sign off on you to come back in the prison. They're still gonna see you like, wait a minute. I'm gonna give this guy a shot at coming into but I I'm I'm not I'm I i do not trust you. I don't. Yeah, like what's, your, what, what's your angle here? Yeah, like, yeah. what do you... Uh, it's only a matter of time before you start smuggling phones in here or dope or anything. Like, w no. These fools are gang members. All they knew is that gang members and criminals don't change. W once a gang member, always a gang member. But then when they see us... I mean, we've had literally uh, community resource managers come up to us and tell us, man, thank you. Really? Like, thank you. You know, because you know what? For, for years, uh, I was stuck in my ways that... That whoever's in prison deserves to be in prison. And if they murder somebody, well, they deserve to stay here for the rest of their life. But I've seen that change in you guys and what you guys do. You know, you guys come in here and all you do is help. All you want to do is help. You guys don't come in here with an attitude. You don't come in here with the mentality of a gang member or a criminal. You come in here as humble individuals that all you want to do is help. And not only are you helping, but you're sacrificing because you're driving all the way out here. Mm -hmm. Four-hour drives. And you're staying out here for four days. And then you come home to your family for three. And then you ride back on the road for four days. And then you come back for three. So you're literally living out of a suitcase. Damn. You're living out of a suitcase. So if that doesn't say right there that you really care about these guys, because I tell them all the time. I says, we, the reason that we are here is not because of a paycheck. That's not why we're here. We're here because we care. When you where you're at right now in your life, you don't care about yourself, but we do. Sure. We believe in you. We believe that because we're not the exception to the rule. We, we're not special. Yeah, we, we don't have a monopoly name, on this. Our name didn't get picked out of a hat, you know, yeah. and they let us go. Like, we earned this. I want to touch on the paycheck thing because we discussed this, different types of paychecks. So, you know, I hope a lot of people listening to this can f figure out this, receiving the same, same type of paycheck that you're receiving. You, you mentioned... Uh, it's not about, and he mentioned it, not chasing the money, right? I mean, money is, is necessary, but there's a certain type of fulfillment that comes from that. It was like a, I guess, a text message that you read me before we started recording. I kind of wanted you to touch on that just to give people an idea of, like, that type of quote-unquote paycheck. Yeah. Well, you know, it's always rewarding when you get mail or even when the guys come home. Yeah. You know, and they tell you, hey, man, thank you. Like, man, you know what? Uh, what what you went in there when you when you guys went in there and we were part of your group and we were in your class like we listened man and I took your advice and you know what I'm home and I'm th that that's bigger than you know 
Or you walk into a prison and these guys are running across the yard because they're seeing you come in. And they're right? happy, man. And they see you and they're like, bro, I got found suitable. I'm going home. You know, everything that you guys talked about in this board prep class made sense. Yeah. You know, and I went in here and I got my date and I'm going to see my family. I'm going home, bro. Like, just hearing that, bro, is like, man, it gives you chills, bro. It gives sure. you like, like the the hairs on the back of your neck stand up because, like, man, they got a second this, shot at life, man. This dude yeah. is, yeah, because I put myself there when I went through that process, sure, and how I felt, and I tell him all the time. I says, man, when you come home, bro, you're gonna see, like, you're gonna see, like, family is everything, like you living, like live. We've had about. Going maybe on 50 guys that have been home since we started this program. Wow. Now, again, I don't, they did all the work. They deserve to come home, right? We did this much. We just did that one little bit to give them over that hump. Well, you literally gave them right? the hope to the get hope. To, the, to the place of redemption, is what yes. you're saying, which is why it's called the Hope and Redemption Team. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and, and every time um, I hear someone come home it's just like oh man i'm on the right path. Like, and just like their great. family members it impacted them their family members will reach out to you too and thank yes. you because of and it's not because of uh some theories that you had it's more because of the way that you were embodying and like the type of human you were like they knew that you were really about what you were saying you're about so i think to me like when i you know because i work in counseling and like when i'm able to help people it's nice because I'm not having to like lie or put up a facade like you actually feel it at your core that you're actually mm -hmm. adding some value and like that's the type of paycheck that I'm talking about that's yeah. like a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's thing. that you know there's there's no amount of money in the world when you right. when you hear someone that tells you like man because of you. Yeah. Because of you I'm home. Yeah, it because makes of sense. we would you, because all I, all I'm helping them do seriously all I'm helping them do is connect the dots, bro. That's mm -hmm. all I'm helping. And I don't even take credit for that because someone helped me mm. connect the dots in my life. So all I'm really doing is paying it forward. That's all paying I'm doing. Forward, yeah. That's it, bro. That's it. I want to ask you this because, you know, the work you do is it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it gives me chills and I got goosebumps just hearing it. I do it with people that struggle with drug addictions and other things as well and to see them come back into society and get that light in their eyes and that fire under their ass and they're back in with their families and they're helping other people it's it's a beautiful thing it, it keeps it keeps the fire alive inside mm -hmm. of me when life gets tough because life's still mm -hmm. going on you have yeah. work but life is going on life is always in session what would you what would you tell people that are out there that are you know listening or maybe watching what would you what would you tell them if they're upset or lost or confused or don't have purpose or meaning and mm -hmm. uh, full of fear like what what would you tell people out there to to do and to look at well first and foremost just just because i'm sharing every, all this happy stuff right now does not mean that i also have my own issues right sure. that doesn't mean that i still go through stuff myself right um the only difference between then and now is that I, I'm able to acknowledge it. I'm able to, to see it for what it is and know that I have to work on it, mm -hmm. right? That's the difference because I still have issues. With, I still get angry. I still, there's still stuff that, that shows up for me, uh, but I'm aware of it. That's the good thing. If I wasn't aware of it and I would sit there and say, no, that's just how it is. No, it's yeah. not. That's not how it is, right? Um, but, but I'm aware of it and I continue to help that. I continue to, to seek okay different avenues of changing and to answer your question um for the people that don't have purpose in life because i heard it once if you, living a life without a purpose is not even living mm -hmm. right so finding what you like to do figuring it out you know a lot of times uh I, i've i've seen it happen with athletes right i believe uh, uh napoleon kaufman was a, the running back for the raiders back in the early 90s and he was a really good all-star running back, and he just played for two years, and he quit. He quit because he found his calling as a as a as a pastor, really? and he quit. And he gave up millions of dollars. So everybody has a purpose. We all brought we're all brought into this world to have a purpose. We yeah. just have to figure out what that purpose is, right? And a lot of times, if if you don't work on finding your purpose, then you're not going to have a purpose. You're just going to exist. You know, uh, I, one of the things that I tell my guys all the time is, is what do you want your legacy to be like? What do you want to be remembered for? Mm -hmm. Like if you were to pass tomorrow and someone were to come and say some words about you, how do you want to be remembered? Fuck yeah. You know, yeah. how do you want to be remembered? 
And uh, I go, because I, I would want people to remember me as being a good guy, yeah. being someone that was giving, being someone that was um, put others before himself, yeah. when before he wasn't like that. I was selfish. I was irresponsible. You know, I was inconsiderate. I was hateful. Yeah. When today I'm loving, caring, responsible. Yeah, that, that, that's all I know you as. You know what I mean? I just, I just think it's just an interesting thing for, you know, other people to look at similar situations in their lives that that the 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 main purpose of like the damage done murder and redemption is like people have redeemable qualities it's never too late like would you like what would you say like to like 12 year old 13 year old caesar like he would never believe like this shit like Mm -hmm. yo like there's if, hope for this because his whole life was predicated on like acceptance from a gang anger thinking these are the things because you just said you acknowledge things instead of just being fuck it that's the way they are but that's how you used to operate fuck it that's yeah. the way this is whatever like there's people stuck in that like right now like this is the way things are this is how I'm gonna deal with things I know I have all the fucking answers and like that was young I, I, I like that question because if if I had an opportunity to tell myself when I was 12 or 13 something I would tell I would, I would tell myself to believe in me. Knowing what I know now, yeah. I would tell myself to believe in me and have patience and continue to work on myself, right? Mm-hmm. But with that being said, if I had a push button right now right in front of me to rewind that, my life all over again, I wouldn't press it. You wouldn't press it? I would not press it. Yeah, because, same, yeah. because, of, because of what I went through and what I was put through, and at the end of the day, this is what made me. Absolutely. Where I am today. And today, I can honestly tell you that I do love myself today. When before, I told myself, but I didn't love myself. I didn't. Yeah. Because I put myself in danger. I was part of a gang. So eventually, I, I can get either killed or shot or wounded or whatever. So I would put myself in danger before, but I would still tell them, oh, yeah, I, I, I love myself. No, you didn't. Because you were willing to die for something that don't even belong to you. You kind of lo- loved the idea of yourself, like who that character was, like being portrayed as more than actually. Loving yeah, but it was like it was now. a false. It was a yeah, false it was, it was a notion. It was like it wasn't real. Today it's real. Like today, you know, and uh, I might not eat well, right? I might <laughs> not have a good diet. I said, but all I want to do is live, bro. I just want to do enjoy my life, and 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 I really do love myself as that's who I am today, the person that I am today. You know, I, I love who I am because. Um, before I wasn't, you know, I was an ugly individual that that didn't care about nobody but himself. I was selfish, you know. I was irresponsible, and and I was just I was promoting violence, and yeah. I was violent myself. So it was, I, was, I thought I was somebody, but I wasn't, because it was it was it was just something that I had created, sure. right? Uh, um, I had I had. I gave myself this moniker and I became this moniker and I ran with it. Yeah. And even while I was in prison, because one thing that I tell the guys in the pen all the time is the punishment is not you going to prison. The punishment is you getting separated from your family. That's the punishment, yeah. right? You going to prison is just something for you to figure out, okay, where did I go wrong? And what do I need to fix? A lot of people don't take that opportunity right? to do that. Is that correct? Yeah, because they, they just see that, oh, man, I got put in. They, they, they start playing the victim role. And you, know? you were, quote, unquote, wrongfully accused of murder. And you figured a way not to play the victim role. So, again, it goes back to yeah. showing that it's possible to have that different perspective on things. Yeah, absolutely. And so, absolutely. To, so to transition to a different question, then, then what needs to be done for more people to come home like you? What needs to be changed? I mean, I, got, I know you're only working within California, but California is one of the biggest prison complexes in the world not just the, the country right like how do I will sit there and tell you? people to to take a step back and review their life just see the type of person that you were a lot of people still see themselves like oh man but I was I was good you know I helped the lady across the street and I helped the... yeah. no but you were part of a lifestyle that had no regard for anything at any point you could turn into a monster and you would justify it because of whatever color or whatever street you were from or whatever you were sure. Claiming you would turn into, yeah, you were a good guy for one second, but you would turn into a monster in the next. I said, so you have to realize that. And then you put yourself in danger. Sure. Not only yourself, but your community. You know, the people around you. You know, uh, if you had any kids, if you had your old lady with you, if you had, if you were, like, you're living a lifestyle that people have no disregard of anything. Right? Sure. You could be with your mom. And they don't care. Uh, uh, if a dude is, is with the business, yeah, he's going to... It's collateral damage yeah, at that point. Yeah, it's like, whatever, dude. I ain't tripping, you know? Sure. Um, and you used to think that way always. But again, going through the process that you explained, like, that's, that's not how you think anymore. And so, like, again, what I, what I want to know is how... 
one of the things I guess I'll I'll bring this up. You brought how like the the governor's thinking of releasing eight thousand inmates, but they're not looking at lifers. Mm -hmm. So it's probably fair to say that there's a lot of Caesars like yourself, you mm -hmm. sitting in prison and have this potential to have these um, tremendous amounts of impact on their communities and other lives to carry a message like you're carrying and they're sitting there and they're not being looked at right now. Like how how do they get looked at other than having conversations like this, putting shows out here like this? Like, how do we expand upon your... Like, what's your opinion on, like, how we fix that? So there is a law called 1170D, and yeah. I believe that the Secretary of CDCR spoke about it last week. Okay. Where if you've done more than 50% of your sentence, and if you've been clean from any rule violation, which is a 115, mm -hmm. for the last five years, and you've been doing all these rehabilitative groups in prison, that they can look into it. They can look into Even if you, you have life without parole? No. no but it has, no, no. So has to be a number of years, life, two life. Yeah, if you have an a, a indeterminate sentence, which is a life sentence, um, uh, then, with parole. then you will have that with parole. Got it. But if you're life without, uh, no, that's a whole different topic. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's something that's still being worked on today. Yeah. They're trying to end the LWAP. There's, there's organizations that are trying to end it because... Um, uh, like we discussed, that my, my cellmate, who was you know, 17, 18, year old, 18 years old when he committed his murder, I mean, look, I know him on a personal level. What he did was a terrible thing, but I don't think he's a terrible person knowing the story of what he did and how he did it. And he's a young kid influenced by a lot of older people. doesn't excuse murder, right? Mm -hmm. But it still can uh, play a factor in, you know, the circumstances that led to that happening. And I believe that kids like him should have the opportunity to rehabilitate themselves and then have a life and then try to add value to other people's lives to kind of, I don't know, make up for that. You get so, what I'm saying? So for your friend, and, yeah. I, and I believe uh, because he's in Ironwood and they have so much programming in Ironwood, yeah. uh, what could happen with him is this. He can involve himself in as many groups as possible, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, give it some time, you know, do a little bit of his he's time. Happen, I, yeah. I don't know how long he's been down, but I want to say... It's just like six years? Yeah, give it about 10, 15. I know it sounds crazy, but, yeah, yeah, but you know... more than 50, 60 Yeah, give, him, give, give that much time. Um, stay away from any kind of rule violations, right? And there's this thing called the commutation that people could do. The governor has commuted numerous and numerous amounts of sentences. People with LWAPs, people with like 80 years to life, people with 100 years to life... Um, he has commuted him down to like 25 to life, right? So what he can do is he can stay disciplinary free, get a lot of as much education, as much self-help as possible. And then once he reaches like his 10th or 15th year, mm -hmm. put a packet together because those commentation papers, it's only four questions. You know, and one of them is like, why do you deserve to be, get your sentence commuted? Like you committed a heinous. Like it doesn't say that. But it says, why do you, you know, you feel like you should, you know? Yeah. And I always tell guys, I always, act, I always say stuff like, man, you don't, you feel like you don't deserve anything. But you, all you can say is that you're no longer the person that you were before. This is who you are today. This is the transformation. Yeah. Show them, yeah. show them that you've done the work, and the governor. What would take into consideration and commuting that life without sentence and get an opportunity to have like a 25 life and then you do 25 years you go up for a hearing and if you really internalize all these groups that you've done yeah then it will be easy for you and then, and that, then you have another chance and there it goes answering my question how do we get more caesars out and get into your chair to talk like this it, yes. it's, it's, it's exactly that yes and it was, and, and, yeah. and it's been happening a lot of guys you know, because one thing that, um, you know, guys in prison, they're very impatient, right? So everybody wants to file a commutation. Here, the thing is, is the, the commutation is so important because you only get one every every governor, right? So Newsom's in right now. He's yeah. our governor, right? So if you file a commutation, if you say your friend files one right now, then he's that's it. If he says no, then he's stuck until the wait. next governor yeah. okay. comes in, you know, and then he'll file another one, right? Um, so it's best if it gets all his ducks lined up practice some patience you know we all gotta pay for our sins that's just the bottom line 100%. i've always said that you know what i got arrested for a crime i didn't commit but i I'm, i paid for all the stuff that i got away from mm. that i got away with you know um so we all eventually have to pay for all the stuff that we've done no matter what you know whether it's here or whether it's somewhere else who knows um, but there's different avenues now you know, uh, I'm hoping that the governor does look into releasing some really good lifers that deserve to come home. Yeah. Um, a lot of these guys, uh, that's why reentry is so important. 
That's yeah. why I love doing the reentry work. I love it because there's a lot of stuff that I learned through the shoe. Yeah. I, I've always given a lot of credit to Beta Shuba. Yeah. Um, you know, they helped me get to where I'm at today. Um, they, I wanted to hit the ground running when I came home. Mm-hmm. And they were like, no, <laughs> no, no. Here's a pass for four hours and you got to come yeah, back. That's it. I'm like, what? That's oh, yeah. And, and Shane's got to go with you because you've only <laughs> been here like 30 days. And, and what? I don't need no chaperone. And like, but all that stuff helped. Yeah. It really helped, you know. And at, you know, at that time, and this is what I mean about, about not being uh, fixed because you could work, you have to continue working on those issues because they pop up sometimes, you know. The old you wants to come out. And I always tell the guys, like, that old you, the person that you created, it's still there. He's just locked up in that little cage right now. Yeah. He can come out, you know, once you get away from the work and you start going back to all about you, then that little key starts to go into a little hole and then and it starts turning. And then he comes out. I said, so for a lot of us, like for me, I would literally have to have CGA for the rest of my life because um, every time I feel like one of my character defects or one of my shortcomings pops up, I want to be able to address it. But that's, that's how know? it should be. Like we're, we're, we're always a work in progress, yeah. right? There's always more work to be done. Always. As soon as you, you know, like for me in my life, it's like I... I've put to bed some things or they're at least at bay and not they're not uh, dominating me. New things come up and mm-hmm. that's fine. That's 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 why there's the work. That's why there's practical application. That's why there's living with spiritual principles. That's why there's checking in with other people, being vulnerable, honest, helping other people like all of this stuff allows me to get outside of myself. Mm-hmm. And when I'm outside of myself, then, you know, that's when when I'm really connecting with another human being. I mean, that's what I think that we're really here for. Love, connection, helping um, really gives purpose to One me. One thing that I tell the guys when they come home, I tell them, look, man, I says, I know that you guys are tired of doing these groups in here, but when you come home, you have to continue these groups. Like, why? Why do I have to? I'm already home. Like, why do I have to continue? I says, man, I says, because this stuff can come up. I said, remember one thing, you guys been away for 20 some years, which is almost two decades, you know? Um, the world that you left back in the 80s, 90s is not the same one from today, sure. right? I said, so you have to really um, learn how to live out here again. You know, there's so much stuff that's new out here that you, that, you know, if you don't seek out help, like uh, um, the importance of transitional housing, right? Yeah. A lot of people are like, oh, I have my girl or I have my family. I'm going over there. I'm like, yeah. bro, here's, a, here's why it's important for you to go to transitional housing, right? Because if we're all in the transitional housing in here, all four of us, right? Yeah. And I just, I'm the newest one here. But you've been here six months and you've been here six months. So you guys know how to wear And I'm starting feeling all this anxiety is overwhelming. I can't reach out to my girl and be like, hey, why am I feeling like this? She's going to tell me, hey, man, man up, fool to me. Why are you feeling like this? What the hell's wrong with you? Like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Like, what happened, right? Yeah. She's not going to know how to help me. But because you probably went through the similar things that I'm going through right now because I'm the one that's fresh out. Mm-hmm. You're going to be able to tell me, like, fool, this is, this is normal. Like, yeah. don't trip. Like, just give us some time. This is why you need to decompress. That's why you need to continue these groups. That's why the, the program that you had in there, try to, you know, continue it out here. Because being in prison, time management is easy. It's really simple. You get up in the morning, you go to breakfast, you go to work, you go to the yard, you come back, your day's over. Mm-hmm. Right? Out here, it's like, no, you got work, you got this, you got to go over here, you got to go over there. Yeah. And it's hard for you to have a schedule, you know? So your time management could be thrown off. Sure. Right? Today, like when Shane uh, texted me yesterday, he said, hey, are you going to be at five? And I, I lost track. I was at the beach. Yeah. <laughs> and then I completely forgot. And then this morning, I'm like, oh, man. And I'm like, okay, well, what are I going on today? Okay, we got to go over here. We gotta, okay, you know what I'm going to make? Just to be, because I don't want to be late. Make it at six, cause I'm gonna go. One thing that I do, I keep my word. So yeah. if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it. You know, uh, unless something drastic happens, then I'll be like, bro, I can't, I can't, I'm not gonna make it. But if I give you my word about doing something like this, I'm here. You know, and I'm here early, cause I don't want to be like, oh man, I'm ten minutes late. I'm like five yeah. minutes away. Like I'll be a few that. minutes early. Yeah, I understand. One of the so. things that I, I I learned from from a good friend of mine was. You know, I always be the first one there and be the last one to leave. So I always be early for whatever appointments. You don't want, you don't ever want to be looked at in the light of being late mm-hmm. or you know not being responsible. You sure. know, so that's the way. That's that's the way I look at life today. Just be responsible. You know, if you're gonna say something or do it, do it. 
Yeah, plain and simple. I love that. I think it's, uh, we're going to end on that. Thank you so much for coming out, man. I'm grateful for our friendship and for the work that you do and, and to just know somebody that's really, I mean, you're a miracle, man. And uh, you've always shown love and kindness and to me and my brother, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you, man. And uh, uh-huh. do you want to just uh, let people know where they can like find your organization so they can donate, look more into it, educate themselves further about what you, what you guys are doing? Yeah, so ARC is a nonprofit organization that's based right here a lot of Los, out of Los Angeles. Uh-huh. Um, it's on 7th and Alameda. Um, it's a great organization that really helps formerly incarcerated individuals, men and women, um, to get them on their feet. You know, uh, they provide cohorts for them to get them into the union, to construction union. They have the movie industry, uh, Manifest Works. Uh, man, they're just doing so much stuff. They're just, you know, we're called the anti-recidivism for a reason, mm-hmm. right? We, we, we're, we're trying to get all these guys that are coming home in our landing not to commit any more crimes, right? And not make any more victims mm-hmm. and just be productive members of society. You know, there's five things that, that we go by is, is gang-free, drug-free, uh, willing to give back, be of service, or go to school. Those are the things that we always ask for for our members that when they become ARC members. Um, and, you know, right now because of COVID, obviously our offices are closed, but there's still ways to get in touch. Sure. Right, whether through the internet, through our Zoom meetings, or whatever we're doing. So they can just Google Anti Recidivism Coalition, or is it ARC.com or org? No, Anti Recidivism Coalition. Yeah. And it'll pop up. They have a, a, a nice web page where it yeah, shows all the work that we do. Um, I, I think the best part of being an ARC member mm-hmm. is the outings. Uh, every year there's like four outings, I believe. Uh, for Christmas, we have, um, uh, well, for Christmas, we have it, we have it off. But right before we get back into work, we have like this, this uh, these uh, retreats. Uh, this last one, this last January was in Big Bear. So that was cool being in the snow, you know. Nice. I haven't been in the snow since, <laughs> man, since I was in high desert, yeah, yeah. right? Um, and then they have Catalina. Like they take all the members to Catalina Island. And not the nice side, not the little, where all the fancy restaurants are at. Right the hiking where the buffaloes are at and the yeah. foxes and all that stuff back there so it's like a five mile hike back there yeah. uh, and then they have the white water rafting right they take all these the other members to you know whoever whoever uh, signs up that wants to go um, white water rafting all the way to Sacramento it's uh, the only way you can get in there is through either the raft or the helicopter drops you off that's yeah. the only way um, so they're getting ready to put more events together, but again, this COVID is sort of put yeah, a, it complicates a dent. things. It, yeah, it, it complicates stuff right now, but um, it's a great organization. If people want to donate to it, it's man, you know, because it's a nonprofit, so everything is, is donations and yeah. uh, charity. So we just try to get people that that come home and that are part of ARC to be productive members of society, you know, and give back, be of service, you know, don't make it about you, man. Make it about try to try to try to make things right. You know, you you you, uh, you know. Like I always say, I, I you know, I, I'm I'm back to where I started from in the city. The only difference is that now I'm productive. Now I want to be able to build that. Now I'll be able to be you know. At one point I was a problem. Now I'm the solution. Sure. Right. So that's what I want to do. I just want to be able to help and and and, and build and do whatever I can to make things right, to just keep pay back a yeah. little bit. And that's exactly what you're destroy. doing. That's what you've done and you're doing. And there's no reason you wouldn't continue to do that. And anyone listening to this, I mean, this is uh, one of three people that you've already heard us talk that has been part of that organization. And so they, they do real work. And, uh, again, check them out, Anti-Recidivism Recidivism Coalition on Google. <laughs> and then as far as our show, you know, subscribe on YouTube or like follow share all that kind of stuff on our social media at the damage done on instagram and we're across all major platforms for podcasts spotify apple music google iHeartRadio. thanks for listening